Good morning, everybody. Uh, this week, we're going to start looking at some more complex number stuff, which will take us up to half term. Today, we're going to look at something called De Moivre's theorem. Um, De Moivre is going to be in most of this chapter. It's really good. Um, so what I'd like you guys to do first off today is look at this complex number here. Z is equal to 2 lots of cos pi over 6 plus i sine pi over 6. And what I'd like you guys to do is work out what z times z is, what z cubed is, and can you try and think about what z to the n would be? So can you just have a go at those, pause the video, and then come back to me when you've tried those three there, please. Okay, so hopefully you managed to get these two absolutely fine. Remember when we are timesing, uh, when we're timesing complex numbers together in modulus argument form, modulus and argument, what we do is we add, sorry, we times the moduli together and we add the arguments. So I've times two by itself to get four, and I've add the argument to itself to get two pi over six. Remember that this plus sign here needs to be here, and if this is a minus here, you would have to adapt this to make it a plus sign. Um, obviously this is a plus sign, so we don't have to worry about that. But in general, make sure you remember that for when you're doing your exercises later. Z cubed, so I've just ended up times in two by itself three times, because I'm times in Z by itself three times to get eight. I've added the arguments together three times to get three pi over six. And hopefully for this one, you've got two to the power of n cos n pi over six plus i sine pi n pi over 6. And this bottom line here leads us on to what de Moivre's theorem is. De Moivre's theorem says for some complex number in modulus argument form, for the modulus of r, an argument of theta, z equals that, then z to the n is equal r to the n cos n theta plus i sine n theta. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so this, um, just to be clear, this is definitely not a proof. This is obviously, this obviously is true. And we've inferred from that, we've hypothesized that this is probably true. And um, it's actually true for all integers n. So that's positives and negatives. So, given that that's true, or given that at least I'm saying that's true, what, um, it would be nice to be able to prove that. Now, I'm not going to do that right now. However, I'm going to leave that for you if you want to do it. Um, so the easiest way to prove this is a proof by induction. So you can check that it's true for 1. You could check that it's, assume that it's true for k, show that it's true for k plus 1, etc., etc. And the best way to do this by proof by induction is do it for the positive n first. There's a trivial n equals zero situation, which is full straight out. And then lastly, have a look at the negative n. Okay, there's no particular reason to do it in that order apart from this is relatively straightforward, and um, this is just comes straight out, and this bit's probably a slightly more tricky because you're not used to using um, <clears throat> you're not used to using uh, negatives when you're doing inductions. So with this sort of induction, where we're counting down as opposed to counting up, so it's sort of like saying if it's true for minus one, show that it's true for minus two, which is true for minus three, etc., etc. Um, yeah, feel, so have a go at that. I, I will go through this tomorrow. Um, just a quick 
word of something which you possibly could use. Um, one second. So one thing which is going to be useful when doing this, thinking back to quite a few lessons ago when we did complex numbers and geometry, is your compound angle formulae, which I can never remember off the top of my head. The ones which were sine a plus b, remember we drew that big picture. Sine a plus b, or oh, let me try and think, is it sine a? I think it is cos b plus sine b cos a, I think. You'll have to just check these. Um, cos a plus b um, is, which way round is it? I think it's this. It's worth checking those. Um, so I think cos a plus b is sine a sine b minus cos a cos b. Sine a plus b is sine a cos b plus sine b cos a. They may be very wrong. Let's hope not. Okay. So um, where are we going next? Yes. So you guys have a go at that. Um, if you want to today, if you don't want to do it today, then it will come up another time, I'm sure. However, instead, let's have a quick go at one example. And then I'll let you guys crack on with some exercises. So let's try the following. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Use De Moivre's theorem to simplify minus 1 plus root 3i all to the power of 5. Okay, so the first thing to do here is to work out what z is, what the inside of this bracket is. So have a quick go at trying to remind yourself how to convert from um, this form into modulus argument form. Think about the fact that you need the argument and you need the uh, modulus. So pause the video, have a quick go at that. So hopefully you found that the modulus of z is 2, which is pretty straightforward. And then what you can do is draw, what you should do is draw yourself a little diagram of where z is. So z's minus 1 plus root 3i even. Let's put an i there. So we're looking for this argument here. So if I use this right angle triangle, I'm going to be able to find this angle in here. So let's just call that angle there alpha. So tan of alpha is equal to root 3 over 1. Yes, that's minus 1, but the length of this triangle is 1. And if I've got tan of alpha equals root 3, then that must mean that alpha is going to be pi over 3. With um, this is this is an example of why you really should know your trig ratios off the top of your head. Um, so knowing that tan alpha equals root 3, you'll remember that alpha therefore must be 60 degrees or pi over 3 in this case. Um, it really does save you some time, even though you might end up check, double checking on your calculator. So if alpha equals pi over 3, then the argument, so that implies that the argument of z is equal to 2 pi over 3. Lots of textbooks, lots of people online, lots of different places will just say you need to do arctan of this and then you have to remember which quadrant it is in to decide whether it's positive or negative. You can do that. Um, however, I think this method is much more revealing of what's going on um, and doesn't require silly tricks. Okay, so we've managed to find out what z is. We've managed to find it in its modulus argument form, which is z is equal to 2 cos, um, what was it again, 2 pi over 3. Where am I? There I am. 2 pi over 3 plus i sine 2 pi over 3. Therefore, z to the 5 is going to be uh, 2 to the 5 cos 5 times 2 pi over 3. Make sure you do stick this extra line in. I know it seems daft. 
to do so in many ways because you can work all of those things out in your head. However, think about what the examiner wants to do here. The examiner wants to examine whether you know the Moivre's theorem. Um, and by putting these multiples in and this power in, you are showing that you know de Moivre's theorem without writing de Moivre's theorem out. So z to the 5 is equal to 32 cosine of 10 pi over 3 plus i sine 10 pi over 3. <clears throat> now leaving your answer as this is, is fine, however it's, it's a little bit mucky. So if you think about just the way that arguments work, generally we say they go between pi and minus pi, this is obviously a lot more than pi. So if I go around once, that gives me 2 pi, and 2 pi is obviously 6 pi over 3. If I go around another half, that gives me another um, 3 pi over 3. I've got 10 pi over 3 here, so it's actually going to end up here. That's one more pi over 3. So in other words, z to the 5 is actually, if it asked me to write it anyway in a, with the argument being between minus pi and pi, it's 32 cosine minus 2 pi over 3 plus i sine minus 2 pi over 3. Okay, um, just one last bit on this before I go. Um, I can remember sitting down in like, probably third, fourth year university exams doing things like this in a, definitely a slightly more complicated manner. Um, but essentially what I had to do was do something where I had to go from something which had been wound round loads of times to its simplified form. And I used to sit in the exam either drawing pictures or counting on my fingers about how many times things have gone around. Don't try and do this in your head. Just draw yourself a picture, count it on your fingers, whatever you need to do, but get it right. Don't drop a mark by doing something in your head and getting it wrong. If you plan with this wrong, you'll be really upset with yourself. Okay, so what I'd like you guys to do is have a go at some exercises on this, which are hopefully relatively straightforward. So it's exercise 10.1, I'll stick these in the VLE and on class charts. Um, so what I'd like you guys to do is, uh, all of question one to three there, really straightforward. And I think I'm doing misuse here. Yeah, I am. In fact, all the way up to seven and have a go at some red ones if you fancy it. Okay, hope you have a nice day and I'll speak to you guys again tomorrow. Bye-bye.